So um, <clears throat> I'm from the uh, Bureau of Meteorology in, in Australia. Um, and as the National Weather Service, uh, you know, very much we talk about uh, real-time systems. We talk about putting out the weather forecasts. Uh, we talk about uh, emergency uh, environmental responses. We um, have a 24 by operations forecasting center. So essentially what we get to is really important that um, our systems don't fail or that our systems are always available. Um, we bring in a, a quite a few real-time observations uh, from radars, from satellites, from ground networks. Um, the data is coming in, you know, uh, around every five minutes or so from the radars, and we have 50 of them. Uh, every 10 minutes, uh, we're getting 16 channels from Himawari 8. Uh, we have over 30 um, satellite data products that are coming in every day that we assimilate into our forecast system, uh, and that we also use um, in our forecast uh, services as the forecasters are looking at all the information to try and uh, pick out the best forecast. Uh, we have 678 uh, weather, uh, automatic weather stations. We've got rain sensors, river gauges, and the list goes on, uh, including uh, around Australia and the marine. Um, we uh, model from the whole globe down to the region and then down into specific uh, uh, states and cities providing a high-resolution service there. Um, so what's important to us is uh, some of the on-demand needs around high-pack uh, weather forecasting and modeling when we're having severe weather, we're having uh, bushfires, tropical cyclones, severe thunderstorms, things like that, where uh, the people on the ground need some situational awareness about what's coming, what's going to, uh, about to hit them. And then there's the preparations uh, when we're planning or Lead times are really important, whether they're in days, weeks, or months. We talk about taking the information, uh, both observations and taking in the model information, and trying to come up with uh, guidance post-processing products, um, get into automation and forecast verification for the weather services. So we have statistical post-processing. We also have machine learning-like techniques. Um, and we'll continue to see, as we have a large amount of data, it's going to be important that we continue to take the data and, and bring it into information uh, systems and also into our, uh, our decision support systems as well as uh, other customers' decision support systems. Um, we talk about uh, severe storm detection, looking at satellite images, and again, you know, that's where we're trying to pick out features and then advise people about uh, what's coming. Uh, so that um, starts setting up this kind of a production workflow where we have observations coming in, we do a lot of quality control on them, we bring them into our modeling and we go through an assimilation and simulation process. Then we go into this middle part, the, we call it the model data services, where we're generating products out of our modeling systems. And um, this is where we're, we've put... Um, this data production system that I'll talk more about. Uh, and this is where you'll find the DDN hardware that we're using. And then from there, we're taking uh, our products and we're trying to get them into uh, various information systems and out to our forecast services. Uh, if we look at our uh, data growth projections, um, you can see that um, you know, right now we're probably uh, we're sitting at about a terabyte per day or more of modeling data, but that's going to quickly rise. And, you know, there's two things happening there. Uh, we're bringing in ensembles, doing a lot more ensemble modeling to get to probabilistic forecasting. Um, we're also uh, increasing the resolution of our models, and that's driving those uh, data volumes up. Uh, what's clear is that people who had an FTP service from us, um, they're not going to be able to start pulling down you know, seven terabytes a day of data from us. Um, so this is where, you know, going forward, we are looking for the customers to come closer to us um, or us um, uh, both working internal on-premise and also looking at external uh, cloud services. Uh, then on the right side, you see another graph, and it talks about just our internal um, products that we develop. Um, and we send those out to our different forecast regions, and we have five of them. And so we really start trying to compress down 
uh, disseminate the information into something that we can put in front of them. So essentially, those first five days are as important to us. So what we've designed is in the hardware is um, the SSD flash uh, pool for storage. Um, the 30 days is more about us going into um, production time windows in which we're always learning um, and always adjusting our uh, ability to uh, de-bias the models uh, to produce a better product. Um, and we'll do a 30-day uh, window for, for our, our de-biasing. Uh, when we get into machine learning as well, then you know, that's going to take a lot more. And, and I think that's where we'll see our, our growth. Um, and then you know, the rest after that, then the data is just going down into tape. So very simply, what we do is we have um, our XC40s uh, by Cray uh, to do all the simulation, the large parallel jobs. And then we have Aurora, which does all of our products, multi-threaded um, data of intensive workflows. Uh, and then from there, the, the data is then flowing out to the different cloud services or down into the archive system. <clears throat> when we look at, oh, so for all of you who like to know the technical stuff, here's all the technical details for you, um, which just kind of says, um, you know, this is a, a small cluster. We have two of them because uh, if we need to take one down for maintenance, we always need to have a second one running. Um, but we can also, you know, in high demand situations, we can work on both of them at the same time. Uh, and what we have is a CS400 connected to a DDNGS uh, 14KX system running a GPFS. So um, what we have a, an InfiniBand network connecting the two. Um, initially, we've got two petabytes in each side of them. Uh, and we also have 150 terabytes of SSD storage. Uh, that holds out five days of data for us um, uh, inside of those uh, DDN units as well. Essentially what we kind of look like, we have a CPU model, a GPU model, and the um, boxes that are um, in yellow or orange um, are kind of the new bits of um, technology, data caching, storage caching that we're putting in uh, into this uh, data processing system. So we have NVMe flash sitting our node, uh, and then we're sitting uh, SSD flash in the parallel files, file system. Uh, then in the GPU model, then of course you got the high bandwidth memory. So one of the questions I keep asking people is, um, you know, as they're putting these systems in is, you know, how was it designed? How did you design it? Um, was it installed correctly? Uh, how are you achieving the best performance or the potential of the system? And by the way, can you show me? You know, I, give me something that I can actually understand. Um, you know, do we have bottlenecks? How can we improve this? Um, and uh, after every patch and upgrade, is the system performing to its baseline, um, or we, are we seeing an improvement? And um, we also get the user's questions, which is why is my application achieving better performance? Uh, we get into you know, this user will start saying it's the infrastructure, uh, and, you know, and, the, and we start doing our assessment, and we start finding out it could be the application. But if it is the infrastructure, then I want to know how and why there's a problem there, and quickly we have to rectify those problems. Um, so what we've done is had a look at, <clears throat> you know, we talk about roof lines for computational applications. What I was interested in was give me a roof line that talks about the physical hardware limits um, and show me how our, uh, I'll say in this case, an idealized IOR application benchmark uh, performs in the system. So what we had is, um, this is just a little configuration information about GPFS, you know, it's just your uh, pretty normal network um, shared disk server model, NSD servers. And what we have is we have the GPFS running in VMs uh, embedded inside of the DDN controller. Um, just a quick layout of what we see, um, because what we're going to do in the uh, roof line is then take each part of these components, start looking at what the um, maximums are, um, and then we'll start measuring uh, performance across different parts of it and see how we go. Uh, this is the current uh, 
layout. Um, so we have the SSDs are RAID 5 and they're 4 plus 1, and we have our nearline SAS uh, and they're 8 plus 2, RAID 6. So here's the performance we were seeing. We first tried RAID 1 uh, SSD setup, and uh, the performance wasn't what we expected. Um, and then we went back and we looked at RAID 5, and we got much better performance of what I was expecting. So um, that was a kind of an interesting uh, we weren't difference that we weren't expecting. Um, but you know, let's if so. Getting into the roofline analysis, and this is again you know looking at our throughput versus the number of packets, and so we had to kind of think out well, you know, what makes sense as you're trying to lay this roofline out. Uh, the other thing is that we were using two megabyte um, packet size. Um, we weren't, uh, for GPFS, we weren't using a, a, a 4, 8, or um, 10. We were, so those are some areas that we're going to explore. So we're starting right now just at two megabyte. So the first thing is we gave uh, the DDR4 uh, memory controller, the four banks of the canister, and we estimated about 100 gigabytes per second. Um, we had a look at the canisters and the PCI Express SAS bandwidth, uh, and that was about 96. So coming down, we looked at 16 uh, clients on an FD FDR IB, um, and that was about 90. We looked at the um, uh, throughput for 32 nearline SAS pools, and that was about 52. We looked at, um, for one canister, what the PCI Express, which would have been half the other one, so 48. Um, the eight ports, since we were running um, FDRIB, right, then there would be a limitation there. So across eight ports, um, and then we're seeing 44.8. Um, if we look at just some per unit um, breakdowns, just like in the DDR4 transfer uh, banks, um, that was 25. If we look at FDR, for a single port, um, yeah, about 5.6. Uh, looking at um, one nearline SAS pool, we were expecting uh, 1.64. What we measured was 1.2. Uh, when we look at the SSD pool with um, uh, eight pools and 16 clients hitting it, we were getting 36.2 gigabytes per second. Um, now, when we did the nearline SAS pool, <clears throat> with 16 clients and thir uh, 32 in there, then we were seeing 11.6. So um, this kind of comes back to the point that, you know, that wasn't quite what we were expecting, so we need to investigate more and find out where uh, the problem is or how we can find some improvements in, in the performance of the system. So that's the current work that's going on right now. So that kind of, that's about where we're at at this moment. Um, so our next steps is looking at you know, the SFA uh, parameters, look at the GPFS parameters, our configuration. Uh, we're looking at IO forwarding when the RAID groups span uh, RAID processors to see if that's perhaps a problem. And we're also interested in looking at a model, uh, another uh, look at uh, storage IO intensity versus IOPS. And um, thank you very much. We did uh, leave a couple of seconds here for questions. If anybody has one or two questions, as long as Tim's willing. Any uh, questions for uh, Tim? We got a question right here. Sure. Hi, Tim. Very quickly, could you expand a little bit on what you mean on IO intensity versus IOPS for measuring your performance? <clears throat> um, so... <laughs> so I'll, I'll preface this first by saying um, most of this work is done by our um, architect in high-performance data. So, so you've got the director who's going to answer you in, in a very non-technical way, probably. So, um, so in, in terms of um, IOPS, of course, we'd be interested if I have um, a particular application that's going to try and hit the controller very hard, um, and we were looking at you know that. Um, let's, let's call it a single uh, view. If I look at IO intensity, um, then it's going to be, it could be an aggregate of um, applications hitting it with different access patterns, right? Um, 
and, and of course, you know, I'm running an IOR benchmark, so the access pattern is very predictable. Yeah. Thank All right. And I think I saw one other hand up over here. Yeah. Are you running GPFS uh, native on the on the on your Cray, or are you running it through the DVS servers? Um, so the GPFS is running on uh, the DDN controller in uh, virtual uh, machine. Uh, so there's uh, had a slide on it, but um, uh, so it's it's instead of like the other way is pull out uh, the GPFS and run it on a server external from the DDN unit. We're not doing that. Um, in fact, uh, it was interesting. Our architect was really hesitant to do that. And um, after going through this experience, he's actually has changed his mind. So that's great so. to get ready.